Okay, so here we are. Today we're going to talk about uh, the Asian war bow. Uh, sometimes it's called a horse bow. Uh, but what we're really interested in is the technology with which it was made and the, com the components and then how it was uh, used in combat. Um, the design is discussed somewhat in the text that you read for today, but I'm going to sort of walk through it anyway. And this is a uh, Mongol style bow. You'll see the whole thing in a minute when I back out. And one of the reasons I use this one in this demo is because in this case, the materials are still visible. Essentially what you have is a wooden stave that runs down the whole length, but which is almost not even visible anymore because it become it is essentially the skeleton upon which you put the, the, the dynamic components. Uh, and the, one of the main dynamic components is here on the belly, the inside of the bow, is horn. This is horn. You can see this black material here. And it is strong, like the heartwood of a longbow, it is strong under compression. Uh, and on the back of the bow, the outside of the bow, is glued uh, a layer of sinew, usually from the shin bone of a cow or, or um, other animal like it. And that sinew is stretchy and gains strength in tension. Um, and so, in fact, I've to I'm told by people who make horn and sinew bows that one of the ways you adjust the poundage, the draw weight on a bow like this is by adding sinew. It's the easiest sort of material to change the consistency or the depth of it. Uh, and the other uh, major aspect of the design of, a, of an Asian style, which is originally a step style bow uh, made on the steps from what are clearly organic materials <laughs> available on the step, which is horn from um, animals and then sinew from animals uh, with very little wood involved is the compression of the of the geog the geometry of the design it uses a recurve motion a recurve shape and then it uses these ears at the end as levers and i'm going to step back just for a second and when i draw the bow i want you to watch how all the working part of the bow all the bending is occurring in here in the ears or sias are actually being used as a lever to bend the working part of the bow. If you watch that, you will notice that this, this part of the bow is, is not working, it's not bending, it's functioning purely as a lever for all of the energy, the strength, which is contained in here. This particular bow is a 75 pound draw which is sort of on the lower end of a war bow strength. It would, they would have ranged from 75 up to 150, maybe as much as 180. Uh, we know from Manchu records during the Qing Dynasty uh, that they continued to train on, on very heavyweight bows. And they, uh, we have the records that showed different soldiers being able to use different weight bows. They had several standardized draw weights. And 75-80 was the sort of the low end for military draw weight during the Manchu period. Um, what I want to do is also show you how this bow was, was shot, which is dif different in many ways than the English longbow, uh, and how you could do rapid fire shooting from this style of bow in a way that was difficult to do from a longbow. Um, for that, I'm going to use a different bow. This is a, a centimeter by centimeter horn and sinew reproduction of an actual archaeologically excavated Yuan period, that is Mongol conquest uh, period bow. You can see it's a little smaller looking than the one I just showed. It's also wrapped in birch bark. And this wrapping and this paint painting is, the, is replicating the original archeology, span uh, the original model. Uh, that wrapping is designed to protect the glue from, from the elements, uh, to keep moisture and heat out, both of them, depending on what conditions you're in. Uh, over time, it will deteriorate and we know that um, the Mongols actually had trouble when they went into Vietnam because the humidity started delaminating their bows. And you can imagine, you know, riding all the time that the wrappings are going to degrade and the humidity gets in and it breaks down the glue, which is high glue. It's a glue based on the, the skin of, of animals. It's boiled down and then turned into glue. The way this bow is shot, which will be difficult for you to see when I step away, so I'm going to show you in close, is to use a thumb ring rather than the three finger Mediterranean draw we associate with England, but it's called the Mediterranean draw. You use your thumb with the ring on it, wrapped around the string, and then you lock your thumb down with your index finger, and then you draw, and these three fingers aren't really doing anything, like this. 
and just in case anybody's wondering, this is a 55 pound draw weight bow, but it's my accurate one. I really like shooting it. Um, and you also shoot, when you're doing Asian style, you don't shoot on the English side, which is the body side, the, the, with the arrow close to your bow hand. You shoot on the outside of the bow with the arrow closer to your draw hand. And so that you place your thumb underneath the arrow, you lock your finger down, I mean, you lock your thumb down with your forefinger, and then you draw and release. And the probable reason for that is simply pulling from your quiver while on horseback and pulling it up to the outside of the bow as opposed to having to bring it around to the inside of the bow while all while on horseback. And I'll talk about horseback shooting separately in the lecture. But for now, I want to demo one of the things that you can do with this kind of bow um, with, because of the thumb ring and because of the fact that these three fingers aren't otherwise doing anything is I can take multiple arrows and hold them with these other fingers and reload without ever going back to the quiver. Whoops, I don't practice this often enough. And you're supposed to do it without ever looking at your knock. The other way you can do it is you pull your arrows out by the knocks using those three fingers that aren't otherwise doing anything and you load up like this and of course you're doing this all while on horseback and that's in theory why you're doing this is you are trying to limit the number of times you have to go in and out of a quiver. Although some people argue they can do it just as quickly, one arrow at a time, pulling from a back quiver. And so that's that. And we'll talk more about how all this integrates in with the step lifestyle during lecture.